today we will review what we've seen in this past week. That is to say the architecture of the post Mughal period all the way till 1947 when India became a republic. In the 18th century, as the Mughal Empire disintegrated, various states came up. A number of these would survive into the 19th century as the princely states of India, a status accorded to them by the Treaty of Subsidiary Alliance with the British. In all these states, which were later to become princely states, you had palaces which were built in the 18th century and added to in the 19th. All these palaces with their roots in the 18th century were emulating Mughal models of what palace architecture should look like. This is the palace at Patiala, which we saw, which has elements from Mughal buildings, such as the Bangla roof and the Chhatris, but composed in ways that are slightly different. Parts of this palace, which are built in the 19th century, also show European influences, such as bay windows or semicircular arches. But what binds palaces and residential buildings all across India is the use of courtyards. Unlike European buildings, which were enclosed against a hostile climate, Indian buildings, like buildings around the Mediterranean, relied on courtyards to bring in light and air. The kind of ventilation that courtyards allowed also ensured a certain kind of privacy and intimacy in a lot of domestic spaces. The palace at Chandwad, built by the Holkers that we saw, is another example of courtyard architecture. Again, while we could not explore every palace architecture from every princely state, we do have here a representation of three or four different palaces. But notice that the courtyard remains central to all of them. Just like various princely states are borrowing architectural elements from Europe with which they have a greater contact, even within India, a number of princely states are borrowing from other regions of the country. For example, this palace at Chandwad has paintings done by painters from Rajasthan. If one looks at the palace at Udaipur, while the elements are Mughal or Mughal Rajput, inside you see the same courtyard being built with different materials with arcades all around. And lastly, through the 19th and early 20th century, you have princely states that give up on borrowing purely Mughal architectural elements, but also start incorporating European planning and European details. This is the Chao Mahala Palace in Hyderabad, where you have a very conscious mixture at using both languages of architecture, an indigenous one developed under the Mughals and a European one, which is seen from the Renaissance onwards. The British, when they first come to India, have patronized for themselves a purely neoclassical language of architecture. And that is because neoclassicism was the rage in 18th century England. The buildings that they build in Calcutta or in other places like Bombay and Hyderabad confirm to this neoclassicism. In fact, in some parts of India, as late as the early 20th century, you see neoclassical architectural vocabulary being deployed. But as fashions change in England, and England builds itself houses of parliament in the mid 19th century in a style that is supposed to exemplify a certain kind of English muscularity. The style of Victorian Gothic becomes popular in India as well, particularly for building public institutions, 
that are going to announce to the Indian population that the British have arrived as strong rulers. This is the language of architecture that shows the Indian public what Englishness is. The biggest champion of this school of architecture, the Victorian Neo-Gothic, was Sir Bartle Freer, the governor of Bombay. As a result, while Calcutta and Madras, the two presidencies apart from Bombay, kept up with a certain kind of neoclassicism, Bombay in the mid in the mid 19th century completely moves to an architectural idiom that's neo-gothic. You see it all around South Bombay where Bartle Freer built new kinds of institutions that had never been seen before, markets, museums and railway stations. The British also had amongst them a school of architects who thought that Indian architectural designs were better suited for the people. And these British architects were steeped in the details of Indian architecture. They were greatly enabled by the publication of a multi-volume work called the Jaipur Portfolio, in which architectural details from across India, irrespective of historic period, were produced. These served as pattern books for ornamentation. So as the Indian princely states started building for themselves new palaces at the end of the 19th century, they turned to these British architects to provide them designs. Many of these palaces were thus built in this style that British architects felt were characteristic of India. The irony is that this new architecture curiously labeled Indo-Saracenic or in simple words Indo-Islamic was championed by British architects for their Indian patrons. A number of palaces from the late 19th into the early 20th century are built in this style. Between the neoclassical of the early British period, the Victorian Gothic of the middle colonial period and the Indo-Saracenic of the late colonial period, there were several tensions, but it is not always that clear who the patron was and who the architect was. You had Indian patrons that used British architects. You had British patrons who used British architects. And there was no predictability as to who would design in what style. It really reflected the debates in Europe at this time where books like What Style Shall We Build In were written. Europe had become what, what is called a masquerade of styles because now that published details of any style of architecture was available, you could choose to design buildings in absolutely any style that you wished. You could have a plan that was English but details that were Mughal, which is what you see in a number of these palaces. The high courts in Hyderabad are another example of an institution that is British, a plan that is British, but details that reflect a native vocabulary of architecture. But when it came time to design a completely new capital for Imperial India, the site chosen was New Delhi. The capital of India moved from Calcutta to Delhi in 1911. And the new site that was chosen took a couple of decades to build fully. The designer, Edwin Lutyens, was asked to design the buildings and the layout, along with Herbert Baker. And what you see here is what used to be called the Viceregal Mansion, now known as the Rashtrapati Bhavan, beyond which are the two blocks called the North Block and the South Block that currently house various ministries. And the avenue that runs in the middle is the avenue Rajpath, then known as Kingsway. Latians designed for India a capital that in its planning was completely European, but in terms of the architectural detail was a curious mixture of European planning but Indian 
designs. However, here the Indianness of the architectural vocabulary of the architectural elements was subtle. So, while at the Rashtrapati Bhavan you have a dome that is supposed to remind one of the dome of Sanchi, the way it is supported and buttressed actually is European. Similarly, on the roof line, you see small chhatris, very reminiscent of a Mughal way in which chhatris punctuate the roof line, but more profusely. Here, the treatment given is quite stark. Eventually, in the 1920s and 30s, India starts embracing an international language of architecture. The vocabulary is neither derived from Indian history nor European history. There is no more neoclassicism, no more neo-Gothic and no more Indo-Saracenic. What you have are architects like Cloud Batley coming in with a new language of invented ornament called Art Deco in which the entire building is treated as one sculptural object not to be treated as an assembly of parts but as a building that expresses itself. An architect called G.B. Matre who had worked with Cloud Batley built on Marine Drive a whole slew of buildings in this style of the new emerging Art Deco. Around the same time there was an international movement started at the Bauhaus in Germany which would translate into completely new forms of design. Simple elegant lines, no baggage of history and clean functionality, the dictum that form follows function were all the hallmarks of this architecture. And with independence to be part of this new modernist movement, Jawaharlal Nehru, the first prime minister, invited one of the biggest exponents of modern architecture, Le Corbusier from Switzerland, to come and design the city of Chandigarh. Chandigarh was laid out along a grid plan. Some of the buildings, Chandigarh was laid out along a grid plan and a number of important buildings were designed by Corbusier himself. Again, all the forms in this building are either functional and if they are ornamental, it is an ornament that does not necessarily reference anything from an architectural history of the past. But it is in modern India that we start having architects who studied abroad and come back, brought to them modernism that is truly Indian. Modernism that makes sense in this context in which it is. Not rejecting entirely all historical detail, but being clued in to the history of the region in which buildings are being designed and built. One of these great architects is Charles Correa, whose uh, Bharat Kala Bhavan in uh, Jaipur is reminiscent of the way in which the city of Jaipur itself is laid out in nine small squares, one of the squares being slightly displaced. Inside, the symbolism and the imagery is reminiscent of architecture of the past in India. The Inter-University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics, located in Pune, is also designed by Le Corbusier where he uses all the traditional elements of Indian architecture such as courtyards and step wells and domed spaces but they are all used in a way that is completely novel and modern. Korea also experiments with forms that are completely new but yet the concept behind them is rooted in a certain kind of traditional architecture. In Delhi, in the 1970s and 80s, you have a number of enterprising architects like Raj Reval, who builds the Hall of Nations at Pragati Maidan. This building, which is the only building contemporary architecture 
or modern architecture to be celebrated on a postage stamp was demolished, unfortunately, last year. But what develops in Delhi is a style of architecture that employs large, exposed concrete. What emerges in Delhi is a style of architecture that uses large surfaces of exposed concrete, a style known as brutalism. Not because it is brutal any, in any way, but because exposed concrete has, uses the word in French, brut. We also had, in the 60s and 70s, apart from Le Corbusier, a number of foreign architects who came and built buildings in India. Joseph Stein being one of them, of whom we do not have examples here, but Louis Kahn, who built the Indian Institute of Management in Ahmedabad. A delightful play of light, space, shadows, air, and volumes. The IIM uses traditional technologies of brick along with the modern plastic technology of reinforced concrete. Another important architect that we cannot miss at all is Balkrishna V. Doshi, who last year won the Pritzker Prize, the highest prize awarded in architecture. This is his office in Ahmedabad. He is best known for a number of buildings, such as the Aranya housing in Indore, and for setting up and designing in some part the School of Environment and Planning in Ahmedabad, SEPT. A traditional modernist, his buildings have also evolved over the years, such as the celebrated Hussein Doshi Gofa, of which we do not have a picture here. From this glorious period of high modernism, we have now moved on, particularly past the 90s, to a period in which what is known as commercial architecture is increasingly built. Driven by developers and builders, this architecture seeks to extract every amount of saleable space they can. Buildings are thought of not as machines for living in, but machines for making money. There is a capitalist attitude towards architecture. Architectural detail, which was once meticulously thought of and crafted, is now replaced by industry catalogs. Designs are made based on what kind of ready-mades you can buy to build in a building. Project managers, in many ways, have replaced designers. So to summarize this week, please do look up examples of everything that we've seen, but examples that we haven't covered in learning sessions. Look up new architects that we haven't mentioned, but who practice in the same modes and idioms that we have looked at. I hope you have enjoyed this course. We will try and make a more comprehensive course of a slightly longer duration at some point in the new future. This was just a brief introduction and I hope you have enjoyed it. If there is any feedback, please do let us know. Thank you.